Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Space This Week. Every Monday, I make these updates for you all to keep you in the loop about all things SpaceX, Starship development, launches from around the globe, and all other stories I think are interesting. And we've got loads to talk about once again today, a bunch of launches from China, two Starlink launches, and of course, the obligatory Starship updates, and much, much more. Let's jump right into things. <laughs> This pick goes hard, right? All 33 Raptor 2 engines firing on Booster 9 during the second integrated flight test of Starship. In fact, this isn't a photo, it's part of a video! A recap video of the flight uploaded by SpaceX to YouTube, thank you. <laughs> Which gives us some great new angles we didn't see during the initial live stream. It's very, very hard to pick a favourite moment from this because, I mean look at it. <laughs> uh, but if I had to pick two, it would probably be this part, you know, shows the hot staging. What's not to love about that, eh? Ooh. <laughs> and then also this. I think this is the first view we've had of the actual explosion of Ship 25. Did I miss someone else's footage that I didn't see? This is the first time I've seen uh, Ship 25's destruction, so maybe it's the first time you've seen it. And if it's not, and I'm an idiot and missed something, I apologise. Please like the video and subscribe and ring the bell, thank you, and let's uh, let's talk about this. At the launch pad, it looks like things weren't quite as flawless post-launch as they seemed. At least, that's what I assume based on the fact that over the past week or so, SpaceX has swapped out all 20 of the Super Heavy hold down clamps on the orbital launch mount, which is something they had to do after Flight 1 as well. We assumed the first time they were replaced was due to damage from that rock tornado, but the fact that they need replacing again means they might not be retracting fast enough, or simply aren't strong enough to stand up to the might of the 33 Raptor engines. I'm curious if the new ones being swapped in are upgraded in any way, or in fact are just the same launch clamps that were removed simply for inspection. The hold down clamps weren't the only things removed from the launch pad. Following the recent removal of the booster quick disconnect hood, we saw the removal of one and then two flex hoses from the mechanism. Now all of this might just be for post launch inspection, but then again, they may need replacing. Hopefully it's the former and not the latter. That wasn't the only stuff we saw going down at the gateway to Mars. We saw a retraction test of the Starship quick disconnect arm and full raising of the chopsticks after crews conducted some post-launch work on them over the course of the past couple of weeks. Good to see all still appears to work well. The entrance to the launch area is rapidly undergoing change. The container wall has been completely removed from the perimeter now, and we're seeing the continued installation of more and more horizontal tanks and their respective pipeworks. The pre-existing tanks were seen venting last week as well. This is because they're being filled with propellant for the next resident of the launch mount, Booster 10. Booster 10 is expected to be the next Super Heavy to fly, and here you can see it in the Mega Bay captured last Monday having its shiny new hot staging ring installed. It was later moved to the Rocket Garden. Here's a little clip here from NASA Spaceflight of the booster rolling out, and here's a great shot here from Sean Doherty showing the current inhabitants of the Rocket Garden. From left to right we have Ship 20, Ship 31, Ship 26, Booster 4 and Booster 10. You can see the slight height difference that Booster 10's hot staging ring adds there. The odd one out in this picture is of course Ship 26. It has no flaps or tiles, and we think that it was built as a quick and dirty Starship just to give Super Heavy something to launch while SpaceX worked on the proper Starship prototypes at the time because they assumed that Super Heavy would be able to launch much earlier. Obviously, various delays meant that Ship 25 ended up being completed for Flight 2, and with the other fully tiled and flapped Starships very close to flight readiness themselves, there's not really any more need for Ship 26. At least, that's what we can assume, because since this shot was captured, the prototype has been hooked up to a crane, presumably for scrapping. Goodbye, Ship 26. Uh, you sucked and nobody liked you. Greg, Scott and Fariel were back in the air last week, bringing us brand new flyover pictures of Cape Canaveral. Here you can see Blue Origin's launch pad and lack of a new Glen, but hopefully we'll be seeing things pick up the pace very soon, as their substantial expansion of their Cape Canaveral site is more or less completed with no more obvious major construction taking place. This, coupled with the recent sighting of new Glen flight hardware, hopefully means that big things can be expected from Blue Origin next year. SpaceX hasn't been slouching either though. We finally started seeing activity take place at the Roberts Road facility, which has been pretty dead for a long time now. Crews can be seen working on the seven Starship Tower segments, preparing them for shipping to Boca Chica. 
Hopefully it won't be too long before we see two towers at Starbase. The chopsticks, carriage and quick disconnect arm remain. It's not clear yet if these will also be making the voyage to Boca Chica or if they'll remain and finally be installed at the existing Starship launch tower at Pad 39A. It's not officially been stated why work to this site has come to basically a halt, but it's speculated that the Starship pad's proximity to the Falcon 9 pad here, which is currently the only pad from which the United States can launch crew missions, is just too close that NASA won't let them test Starship from here and risk critically damaging their only access point to space. SpaceX has been addressing this concern though. Here's a picture from Greg of Launch Complex 40, which as you can see now proudly sports a crew access tower and arm so it won't be too long before this pad can support Crew Dragon. This may then pave the way for continued work on the Starship pad. Or alternatively, SpaceX have just opted to shift the entirety of their focus on Texas and aren't interested in the Cape until Starship is operational. What are your thoughts on this? Let me know in the comments down below. Hangar X stands proud as ever. This building is in service for Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. And in fact, demand for this rocket is so great that it looks like SpaceX have started using the Roberts Road Star Factory building, according to inside reports, for Falcon 9 payload integration. They've also started construction of this extension, which looks to be pretty substantial, which presumably is in support of this new, if possibly only temporary, purpose this building now serves. Speaking of Falcon 9 payloads, it was recently announced that Amazon would begin launching its Starlink killer, Kuiper, aboard Falcon 9, ironically, in view of a lack of rocket from Blue Origin or United Launch Alliance. This may also be because a shareholder sued them for not adequately considering SpaceX as a launch provider when choosing a rocket, and while Amazon have stated that this lawsuit is without merit, I do also totally believe that this probably could have happened. <laughs> anyway, the reason I'm bringing all of this up now is because Greg photographed this building, the Project Comet Payload Processing Facility for Project Kuiper. Construction is really coming to a head here, with the major structural works complete and cladding installation well underway. Lastly, I want to show you this photo from Greg. It's United Launch Alliance's Vulcan on the pad, awaiting wet dress rehearsal. If all goes well, we'll see it rolled back for payload integration before making its maiden flight on Christmas Eve. The clock is ticking on this one, but ULA are very seasoned veterans of spaceflight, so I'm feeling confident that they're gonna nail it. In addition to all the progress they've been making down at Starbase, SpaceX also pulled off two orbital launches last week. The first took place on Thursday. This was a Falcon 9 Block 5, as always, carrying 23 Starlink V2 minis to Starlink Shell 6. The rocket lifted off from Cape Canaveral Space Launch Complex 40, and shortly following stage separation, the Falcon 9 first stage made a successful landing on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship stationed in the Atlantic Ocean. This was this particular booster's, V-1077's, ninth overall mission, so nearly double digits for this one. <laughs> the other Falcon 9 launch we saw take place last week was the very next day, on the 8th of December. This was another Starlink mission, this time Starlink Group 7-8. The rocket lifted off from the Vandenberg Space Launch Complex 4E, carrying 22 Starlink V2 minis to Starlink Shell 7, and shortly following stage separation, the Falcon 9 first stage made a successful landing on the of course I still love you drone ship in the Pacific Ocean. This was this particular booster's B1071's 13th overall mission, so lucky it got through this hurdle. <laughs> Now we had hoped to see a Falcon Heavy launch in addition to the two Falcon 9s we saw, but this was unfortunately pushed back, initially to today, but now it's looking like tomorrow, the 12th of December. This is the USS F-52 mission, and the rocket will not be placing a satellite into geosynchronous Earth orbit, but rather the mysterious X-37B OTV, aka that small space shuttle that the US Air Force has that no one really knows anything about. Very exciting. I won't say too much about this launch because it's going to be covered more in depth next week, so make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss that. The winner of who launched the most last week, though, goes to China, who conducted four orbital launches in total. Beginning at the end of Monday the 4th of December, we saw a Ceres-1 launch vehicle lift off from the Qiquan Satellite Launch Center, carrying two satellites, the Taiyan-16 and the Xingqi-1A. The Taiyan-16 is a meteorological environment detection satellite, while the Xingqi is a remote sensing satellite. Both were carried to orbit by the Ceres-1, and this mission was a big one. This was the return to flight of the Ceres-1 after a failure occurred on the 21st of September. The mission designation was We Won't Stop, and it was all a success, so welcome back Ceres-1. 
The next launch from China took place the next day, on the 5th of December, and this was the second ever launch of the Smart Dragon 3, a new rocket developed by the China Rocket Company Limited, who are affiliated to the China Academy of Launch Vehicle Technology. The solid fueled rocket lifted off from the Bowrun Jizu platform, I probably pronounced that wrong, sorry, in the South China Sea, carrying the Hulian Wang Jishu Shayan 3, an internet technology test satellite. This rocket's second ever mission was a success, and the satellite is now in orbit and operational. It was a couple of days later before we saw the next launch from China. This was a Zhu K2, which launched on Friday the 8th of December, carrying three satellites to low Earth orbit. Zhu K2 is a methalox fueled rocket and is operated by Landspace, a private company located in Huzhou City. The payloads were the Tianyi 33, a low Earth technology demonstration satellite, and the Hongu 1 and Hongu 2 which are also technology demonstration platforms. The mission was a success, and all payloads are now in orbit and operational. The final Chinese launch was on the 10th of December, Sunday, and this was the Long March 2D, and this was a very big one actually. The payload was fairly standard for Long March, it was three Yaogan 3 satellites, which are used for reconnaissance purposes, although China does maintain they are used for civilian use. But the big thing about this launch was the fact that this was the 500th launch of a Long March series rocket. Long March has served China very well and is legendary among rocket families. And it's great to see that its 500th launch went well. <laughs> Let's just rewind though to Friday's Zuke 2 launch. You know that Methalox rocket that Landspace operates? Well, Zuke 2 is the second rocket of the Zuke family, and Landspace recently released a demonstration CGI video of the upcoming Zuke 3. Does it look familiar? It should. It's basically uh, a Methalox Falcon 9. Hey, if the design works, the design works, right? I know it's easy to say, oh, they're copying SpaceX, but I guess there are only really so many ways in which you can design a reusable orbital class booster. I, for one, would love to see more rocket companies start using reusable boosters, so I am very much looking forward to seeing if Landspace can pull this one off, and possibly even put a dent in Falcon 9's dominance in the payload to orbit scene. Although, I mean, this is still Falcon 9, right? Okay, it's Methalox, but it is literally a Falcon 9. Anyway, let's move on to these new amazing photos from the James Webb Space Telescope. Aha, I tricked you. This photo was in fact taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. But I wanted to show you this one first so that you can appreciate the remaster. Here's the same thing taken by James Webb. And that thing is a supernova remnant, described as being similar to a stellar autopsy, according to research lead Danny Milosivljevic. Don't fail me now, how to pronounce.com. <laughs> The supernova itself is Cassiopeia A, which exploded, from Earth's perspective at least, around 340 years ago. The study of supernovas will help scientists understand how it spreads out following stellar death, and enhance our understanding of how stars and celestial objects and possibly even life are formed. NASA put out a helpful video to help us understand what we're looking at here. Starting with the minutiae first, astronomers call these things light echoes, named because they're what remains of the original light of the supernova. We then see these dark spots, or as NASA described, cosmic bullet holes, <laughs> which have been punched into these orange and pink areas by tiny fragments of ejected stellar debris. The orange and pink clouds themselves consist of sulfur, oxygen, argon, and neon. The James Webb Space Telescope is really just the gift that keeps on giving, and I can't wait to see what images we get next. The world celebrated a big anniversary last week. On the 6th of December, all the way back in 1998, six astronauts made the trip to space aboard Space Shuttle Endeavour, carrying the United States' first module for the newly built International Space Station, and then mating it with the Zarya module. Four days later, the crew boarded the station for the first time, and from November 2000, there has been a permanent crewed presence on the ISS, which is still going strong 25 years later. One ongoing experiment right now is the Bacterial Adhesion and Corrosion Study. A common saying on the space station is, yesterday's coffee is today's coffee, because all wastewater needs to be recycled. The Bacterial Adhesion and Corrosion Study aims to investigate how best to control microbial growth in recycled water to ensure it's safe for drinking, and of course ensure maintained integrity of the station's life support systems. It specifically looks into how bacteria adheres to surfaces and potentially even causes corrosion to the station's water systems, hence the experiment's name. 
Remember the Psyche launch in October? Well, the spacecraft has just sent back its first images as part of a test of its twin camera instrument, which captured 68 pictures of a star field in the Pisces constellation, which were used to make up the mosaic currently on screen. The Psyche spacecraft has a long journey ahead and is set to arrive at its destination, asteroid Psyche, which sits in the main belt between Mars and Jupiter, in 2029. Laon Aerospace's Australian division launched a rather cursed rocket last week. I set out to embark- sorry about the Australian jet, that was terrible. <laughs> I set out to launch a rocket starting upside down. The rules of this challenge are the engines of your rocket need to be pointing towards space. And then somehow you got to flip it over so that you can get to space. This was my uh, attempt to the challenge. I built the rocket inside a giant wheel. Uh, I really like how the video turned out and lots of twists and turns throughout the way. It's not just, I like to think it's more than just the novelty of the launch. So if it sounds good to you, there should now be a card on screen. That top one should take you to that video. All this on screen, of course, are my Patreons and YouTube channel members who help make all of this content possible. And of course, big thank you to you for watching this video. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it informative and I hope you found it entertaining. And, oh, the video is not over yet. Um, uh, okay, now it's